Hi there, I'm glad to welcome you to my channel, World of Stories. I have a lot of interesting life stories that I want to share with you. Enjoy listening. You have a bicornuate uterus, the gynecologist looked at Vanessa sympathetically. Bicornuate? The woman asked with astonishment and fear. What does that mean? Unfortunately, it's a rare developmental anomaly. It occurs in about 1% of all women statistically, the doctor gently said. In practice, it means that a normal pregnancy with such anatomical structure of the uterus is almost impossible. But how is that possible? Vanessa said. Why hasn't anyone told me about this before? I can't speak for my colleagues, the doctor shrugged. Do you visit the gynecologist regularly? Vanessa bit her tongue and pondered. Indeed, she didn't like going to doctors, and the last time she saw a gynecologist was ages ago, back in her wild youth, and even that was by accident. She was brought to this clinic by an ambulance because of severe bleeding. My husband and I finally got back on our feet and decided to have a child, Vanessa mumbled. We kept putting it off, delaying. I thought I might be pregnant this last month. You were pregnant, the doctor nodded. The term was very short, but due to the uterine abnormality, you experienced a spontaneous miscarriage, unfortunately. Well, there's still in vitro fertilization, IVF, right? Vanessa shrugged, not used to giving up in the face of difficulties. So, we'll try to solve this problem differently. I'm afraid you don't quite understand, the gynecologist shook her head. With this diagnosis, IVF is not performed. It's an absolute contraindication. The only chance would be several surgeries to reconstruct the uterus, but I want to warn you. In any private clinic, they will gladly take you in for surgery and even give you a positive outlook. However, the statistics show that even after numerous surgeries, the chances of getting pregnant and carrying a healthy child are extremely low. Let's not bury my hopes prematurely, Vanessa said, raising her head defiantly. I'll still try. It's your right, the doctor agreed. I'm just explaining the situation as an experienced specialist. Through my hands, many women have passed who became victims of medical fraud in pursuit of happiness. At least, if you seek help, go to reputable clinics. My advice is to go to the public hospital. They have excellent specialists there. Thank you. Vanessa thanked her and left the office. Unfortunately, the female gynecologist was right. Several long years after the visit described above were spent on Vanessa's treatment. Surgery, then another one, and another. A challenging period of recovery, attempts to conceive naturally, tears, anxieties, constant arguments with her husband, overwhelming concern from acquaintances and friends, endless worries from her mother, her mother-in-law's disgusted meaningful silence with pursed lips. Well, Valerie. The mother-in-law stubbornly called her Valerie, refusing to acknowledge her real name, which she considered wrong and ugly. Another failure? Don't act surprised after all these years. You should have given birth right away. Vanessa could barely contain herself from throwing something at that pretentious face, but one day, she couldn't take it anymore. She expressed everything that had accumulated inside her to her mother-in-law. The woman widened her eyes at such unprecedented audacity, complained to her son, and said that she wouldn't set foot in this house again until his wife learned to behave properly. Vanessa was just happy that she wouldn't see her detested mother-in-law anytime soon. Of course, she and her husband argued again over this matter, but it was already out of despair. Their main family problem had become the complete inability to have children. Vanessa was definitively deemed unfit for motherhood by the doctors. The surgeries didn't help, and even the Republican clinic refused to perform IVF. They said the same thing as the first doctor several years ago, it was an absolute contraindication, that's it. Of course, in private clinics, this contraindication wasn't an issue. Anything could be arranged for the right price. They tried three times, but there was no result. That's it. Gerald, Vanessa's husband, said after the third unsuccessful attempt. Enough. This can't go on like this. You are utterly exhausted. But you want a child so much. Vanessa sobbed. And I can't give you one. 
I'm useless, incapable. Your mother was right, calling me a useless hole. She fell face down on the bed, bursting into such tears that Gerald got genuinely scared. Vanessa, please stop. You know how much I love you. Forget all this. We have a good life together. My little darling, you are the best. It's not your fault, stop, please. He hugged and comforted her as best as he could, but it didn't help much. For several days, Vanessa walked around gloomy as a thundercloud, only mumbling or sulking. Maybe we should adopt a child? Gerald finally asked her. That's not an option, she wearily shook her head, biting her lips. You want to have your child, always have. I know that. I should have given birth, that's true. But now, what's the point? What are you saying? Her husband said gloomily. We know for sure now that it wouldn't have worked even if we did it immediately. It's our fate. There's nothing we can do. How about going on vacation, my dear? Vacation? Yes, exactly. You need a change of scenery, her husband hugged her. To a warm sea, under bright sunshine, away from all this gloom. You won't leave me now, will you? Vanessa asked with hope, looking straight into his eyes. Nonsense, why would you say that? He kissed her forehead and pulled her closer, stroking her back and shoulders. You're my best, my beloved. We've been through so much together. I can't be without you. You know that? Calmed down, Vanessa let out a grateful sigh and closed her eyes. All right then, whatever will be, will be. We really need to go on vacation and unwind. Luckily, they have that opportunity. Vanessa had always been behind Gerald like a solid rock, even during their youth when they were both poor students. Neither of their families could boast of wealth, and after their wedding, they settled in a dormitory at the Enterprise where Gerald worked. By the middle of the second year, he switched to the evening shift to earn a living and support his young wife. He personally renovated the room they settled in, and the entire dormitory came to see it. He even created a textured plaster from ordinary putty, and with his own hands, he made a kitchen set so impressive that it was envied by many. He also managed to install running water in the room. It was fortunate that they shared a wall with the kitchen. They had a fully functional studio, one might say. Vanessa cooked in their room and washed dishes. Only the toilet and shower were shared. Later, after seeing their renovation, the neighbors also had water installed in their rooms. Other neighbors followed suit. Gerald and Vanessa were not stingy and allowed their neighbors to connect through the wall. So, it turned out not to be just a dormitory section but a modern hostel, and they used the communal kitchen for large gatherings. It was such a joyful time back then. Ah, the wonderful and distant years. Now Vanessa fondly and nostalgically remembered them. How young they were, full of hopes for the future. Now, fate had scattered friends from the dormitory to different places, but she maintained relationships with many of them. Vanessa had a wide circle of acquaintances, thanks to her work. Even though she didn't finish her degree in economics, where her parents insisted she go and where she actually met Gerald, she decided to pursue a career in nail service. She always enjoyed it, whereas economics did not bring her joy. As a result, she built her clientele over several years, attending seminars and master classes in her field, and became an excellent nail technician. Now, she had her own salon where she rarely worked, only for her regular and longtime clients, to socialize and chat. Meanwhile, Gerald graduated from the university with honors and ventured into a much larger business than Vanessa's nail salon. That's what she called her salon. In the construction company, several branches were established over time. They built and reconstructed all over the country, installed electrical transmission towers, and laid cables. Gerald's highest qualification was as an electrician in his primary field of expertise, and he had completed his training long before university. Then, when he decided to start his own business, he thought of attending the economics university. Of course, he only went to the construction sites for inspections, he didn't deal with clients himself, except for significant ones during negotiations and business meetings. The trip to the seaside didn't go as smoothly as they had hoped. 
First, they were assigned to some horrible rooms, and Gerald had to go and sort things out, threatening and persuading the indifferent Arabs at the reception who couldn't care less about the complaints of American tourists. When the issue was finally resolved, an unbearably nasty wind blew, carrying continuous sand that persisted along the coast for a whole week. The good weather only arrived four days before their departure. In that time, they managed to get thoroughly bored, aimlessly wandering around the hotel, sunbathing by the indoor pool in case of such occasions, and endlessly consuming alcohol in the lobby bars. On top of that, an incredible number of tourists with children of all ages, from the very young to the older ones, were present. They came to the restaurants for breakfast or dinner, lounged by the pool, and strolled along the impeccable paths amidst tropical greenery. Vanessa and Gerald frequently encountered other people's children. Just our luck. I thought you chose a secluded hotel for a peaceful vacation. Vanessa sarcastically remarked one day. That's what it was. Gerald said. I don't understand why we ended up in some family amusement park. I'm sorry, my dear. I know how unpleasant this is for you. He placed his hand on her delicate, almost untouched by the sun, white hand. Vanessa had a naturally fair complexion, with hair the color of white gold. She tanned heavily, immediately turning red like a boiled lobster. Therefore, she tried to avoid direct sunlight, seeking shade. Vanessa nodded, and tears welled up in her eyes. Just then, a noisy procession of children of all ages led by an entertainer, inviting participants for the evening mini-disco, passed by, shrieking and rejoicing. The happy parents, having temporarily rid themselves of their beloved offspring, sat around, smiling, and sipping refreshing cocktails. Let's leave this place, Vanessa asked and stood up. Gerald followed her, and they slowly, gracefully walked to an open terrace, which provided a breathtaking view of the bay. Vanessa. Gerald embraced her by the shoulders, approaching the parapet where she stood, gazing thoughtfully into the distance. Let's go back to our room. I can't, she shook her head. You know the doctors prohibited it for a whole month. Maybe it's already okay? He gently ran his hand over her delicate and almost transparent skin, from the nape down her neck, then lower along the long, open back of her dress. Stop it. Vanessa protested, pulling away. I don't know how you feel, but I haven't completely lost hope yet. They said it's not allowed. So, it's not allowed. We still have four whole days left, then we'll try. All right. Gerald sighed and walked away, as usual, to the bar. The attempt to try happened closer to the end of the vacation and, to put it mildly, was unsuccessful. Vanessa was tense and focused, as if she was trying not to lose an important match. Relax, my darling. Gerald pleaded. Sorry, but all I can think about is not having the internal stitches tear, she exhaled and slipped away to the restroom. You don't understand how lucky you are, her close friend said a few days after they returned home. Any other man in Gerald's place would have cheated a long time ago, but he's patient. It means he loves you. Anyone can see that with the naked eye. Nothing has changed since university. Sometimes it's easier to see from the outside. Trust me. Your husband is still head over heels for you. So, stop tormenting yourself and be grateful for what you have. Do you think there are few unhappy marriages with children? There are plenty. Take us, for example. The friend demonstratively laughed, showing off her perfectly restored, brilliantly white teeth from an expensive dentist. I know, dear. You've had a tough time too. Vanessa sympathetically looked at her friend, who had two beautiful children and an unfaithful husband who couldn't resist any skirt that passed by. In the end, Betsy kicked him out of the house, but he returned like a beaten dog. That's how it started between them. He would go astray, and she would forgive him. Wiping away tears again and again, each time hoping that someday her Don Juan would change. Kevin and Gwen already understood everything about them long ago. Betsy complained in the meantime. My patience is also wearing thin. You know, I've decided to leave for somewhere far away, just to get away from him. Maybe that's the right decision, Vanessa thoughtfully sighed. Just don't forget to leave me your address, she smiled at her friend. 
They laughed, had a cocktail each, then coffee, and went for a stroll. After such meetings, life seemed brighter, and their own problems took a back seat. Otherwise, everything was good, even wonderful, between Vanessa and Gerald. They had been living comfortably for many years, not denying themselves anything, and they weren't tied to one job, which allowed them to travel a lot. In the breaks, of course, between Vanessa's prolonged treatments. Maybe it's enough already? She thought, slowly walking along the boulevard overgrown with red maples. Fate doesn't allow us to have children. Is that how it's meant to be? Arriving home, Vanessa took her phone out of her bag and discovered missed calls and messages from Gerald. I went to a project on urgent business. I'll be back late. It's far away in the region. Lenny is with me. Don't worry. Vanessa sighed, poured herself some tea, took some cookies and sweets, and settled in front of the television, putting a comfortable cushion under her arm. She knew that sometimes unpleasant things happened at the sites, and then Gerald and Lenny, his deputy and closest friend, rushed there to personally assess the scale of the damage and find the right solution. Vanessa trusted Gerald endlessly. They truly had warm and affectionate, even friendly relations, and they looked at life the same way. There was no happier couple in the world if not for one thing. Annoyed, she waved this thought away like a pesky fly. Vanessa wrote Gerald a cheerful and playful message. Good luck on the project. Say hi to Lenny. We're waiting for you at home, and if you end up staying late and it's too late to return, then just stay somewhere there, no big deal. Kisses and hugs. Without noticing, she fell asleep after some time, right on the couch, not even making it to the bedroom. She woke up when it was already dawn outside, and a gloomy autumn morning was creeping in. There was no sign of her husband at home. Apparently, they really stayed until morning and didn't return due to bad dirt roads. That's probably for the best. Vanessa thought and went to make herself some coffee. Meanwhile, Gerald woke up at around the same time, more than 200 kilometers away from his wife, also deciding to have coffee, but in completely different circumstances. They arrived at the location the previous evening, just as it was getting dark. Autumn days were short. Moreover, they got stuck in a traffic jam on a bypass road because, as usual, the road services decided to repair a lane at the intersection. Damn it! Gerald cursed and rolled down the window to have a smoke while they slowly crawled along, missing the last opportunity to arrive at the site while it was still light. And what are we going to see there now? Maybe turn back before it's too late? Lenny asked. No, we've decided, so we've decided, Gerald insisted. The client is waiting for us. The client turned out to be a rather pretentious and even infuriated young lady. Very impressive, energetic, and very, very angry. As far as I understand, you are the management? She gave them a haughty look, instead of greeting the men. We are. Lenny nodded. You understand correctly. Then please explain to me. She immediately grabbed the bull by the horns, already worked up. Why on earth are your workers digging up my plot in all directions for the third time, if there's an approved survey plan? Do you see the problem? Lenny began, but Gerald interrupted him, raising his hand, and addressed the woman himself. We haven't even properly introduced ourselves yet. This won't do. I am Gerald Taylor, the CEO of the company, and this is Lenny Brooks, my deputy and the most competent specialist in this field. And what's your name? And he smiled widely at the woman, inviting her to soften her confrontational stance. Isabella, she reluctantly said, contorting her tired face. But what's with all these formalities? Why don't you just explain to me what's going on? All right, Gerald nodded. Look here, please. He opened a picture on his phone. Is this your land survey plan? Yes, Isabella agreed. Our company did not prepare this plan, Gerald informed her. Do you think I'm not aware of that? Isabella asked sarcastically. I know you're aware, Gerald reassured her. But that's precisely why we can't take responsibility and install a water pipeline based on an inadequate documentation. So why is it inadequate? Isabella protested. 
I paid for it as if it were perfectly suitable documentation. We don't doubt that, Gerald sighed. However, if we were to construct everything according to this land survey plan, in six months, you'd end up with a real swamp in your property and the house. You see, when we made the first excavation, we found out that there's too much groundwater in this spot, and installing pipes there would be futile. So, we dug a bit to the left. I hope the plan is inaccurate by just a few meters, but the same situation is there as well. I'm afraid we'll have to conduct a new land survey. I'm not ready for such additional expenses, the woman frowned. I completely understand, Gerald assured her. From our side, I can offer the following, considering the total cost of your estimate and the fact that you trusted us based on recommendations from our previous clients, we'll give you a 10% discount on the overall amount for the rough work on the property and the same for the house. However, a new plan is still necessary. Understand, Isabella. We could easily do as your survey indicates, but as I explained before, it will inevitably lead to problems. Our company cannot take such a reputational risk. We always honestly warn our clients. I understand, Isabella pondered. Thank you for explaining. You know, it's already late now. I was waiting for you earlier, and in the dark, we won't be able to see anything in these excavations. I would like to see with my own eyes and inspect the samples you mentioned. Of course, Gerald agreed. That's why my colleague and I will spend the night at a local motel and in the morning, with a fresh mind, so to speak, we'll continue this conversation. The workers said you live nearby. So, you won't have to drive in the dark. Or am I mistaken? You're not mistaken. Isabella smiled slightly. I'm actually staying with my friend. Her house is in the same village, and that's why I decided to build here because I visit her often and I like it here. Perfect. Gerald approved. So, we'll see you in the morning. Is 9 a.m. convenient for you? Yes, the woman said. But I have another suggestion for you, spend the night at my place. I mean, in my friend's house. They're not here now, they're away. I'm looking after their house and, incidentally, overseeing the construction process of my house. In that hole where you're planning to stay, there's nothing, not even decent beds. Trust me, I've been through it. I'm comfortable here, and there's plenty of space. So, are you okay, with that? With pleasure, Gerald smiled, paying no attention to Lenny, who was tugging at his sleeve. Well then. Lenny asked when they were already in the car, slowly following behind their client's white Toyota. Why did we agree to this troublesome woman? She's going to drive us crazy. Well, you know, the choice is limited, Gerald grinned. Either she drives us crazy or we get eaten alive by lice in that motel. I personally choose the former. Besides, emotional contact with a major client is everything for us. Or have you forgotten? Yes, I remember, I remember, Lenny grumbled irritably, throwing the cigarette but out of the window. Let the self-made psychologist drive then, steer. In Isabella's friend's cottage, they got the promised comfort, good coffee, and a warmly burning fireplace. Lenny brought some brandy from the car, and Isabella graciously allowed them to indulge in drinking, even joining them, taking a sip from a small glass. Good night. I'll leave you, esteemed gentleman, she said politely and sarcastically half an hour later. See you in the morning, and she disappeared up the stairs. Not bad, our client, Lenny smirked, who had been admiring Isabella's charms all evening, which the tight bathrobe not only didn't hide but accentuated. Well done, Lenny, Gerald frowned. Showing that he wasn't interested in these charms, but truth be told, this striking woman had also captivated him. They sat for a while, finishing a bottle, and Lenny, who had worked a lot the day before, felt thoroughly tired. He yawned, stretched, and went to sleep in a small guest room on the first floor. On the contrary, Gerald couldn't sleep. He sat in front of the talking TV, sent a message to Vanessa, received no response, and concluded that she must have already fallen asleep. Then he decided to go to the backyard and smoke to help him sleep better. Maybe fresh air would induce sleep can't sleep either? A slightly teasing voice came from above. 
He had barely taken a drag of his cigarette when he raised his head and saw Isabella on the open balcony of the second floor. Wrapped in a blanket, she was sitting in a woven chair, smoking as well, and smiling at him. In the dim light, her eyes sparkled, reflecting the lantern's glow. Like a contented big cat, Gerald thought to himself and said aloud. Can't seem to find sleep. I keep thinking about your water pipeline. Stop making things up, Isabella chuckled softly. Come upstairs, I'll treat you to some good Brazilian coffee. The hosts on the second floor also have a coffee machine. Gerald understood her hint very well. It was as if he had read everything in her sparkling eyes, but he still went, forgetting about everything else. His wife, his business reputation, all seemed to fade away. That night turned out to be quite eventful, and the next day, driving back home on the highway, Gerald recalled everything that happened the day before as a strange and exciting dream. Because when he woke up, he didn't find Isabella next to him, and she acted as if nothing had happened between them. He couldn't tell if Lenny had any suspicions, Gerald didn't know, but Lenny looked as usual, not asking any questions or dropping any hints. After some time, Gerald decided that this little episode wasn't worth tormenting himself with guilt and tried to forget it as soon as possible. Several months passed. Everything remained the same at work and home. Business was doing well, and Vanessa continued her endless treatments, despite her decision to end it and her plea to Gerald to leave everything as it was. Their marriage had lost any semblance of normal or regular relationships long ago, and an atmosphere of gloomy anxiety hung over the household. At some point, Gerald had enough, and after a quarrel with his wife over some trivial matter, he stormed out of the house, slamming the door in anger. Long-restrained fury was boiling inside him like steam in a closed pressure cooker, demanding an outlet. Since the argument had only heated the degree of his anger, Gerald headed to the familiar bar. One shot, then another, he didn't even notice how he dialed Isabella's number. Hello? A familiar slightly husky and seductive female voice said. Miss me? Yes, he sighed. Can I come over to you? Of course. She replied as if she had been waiting for this call for a long time and had no doubt it would happen eventually. Only now I have a new address. You know, right? From the second meeting onwards, Gerald began to lead a double life. He told Vanessa that he was leaving for a business trip or somewhere else, but in reality, he went to Isabella. With her, everything was calm and easy. They could laugh together, have a drink, make love, and smoke in bed. They could do anything that was not allowed at home. Vanessa, it seemed, didn't even notice her husband's prolonged absences. She was entirely absorbed in her endless and futile treatment. And the guilty conscience that Gerald felt from time to time didn't prevent him from returning to the embrace of this other woman who seemed so different and unfamiliar compared to his wife. He felt she was a stranger. And every time he left her house, he genuinely thought he wouldn't come back again, but he always returned. It was as if a magnet was pulling him here, to change the suffocating domestic atmosphere and Vanessa's depression for the joy, lightness, and sense of complete freedom that came with his connection to Isabella. And how surprised he was one day, lying next to her in bed, as usual, and smoking another electronic cigarette when Isabella, in a completely matter-of-fact tone, said to him. Gerald. I'm pregnant. What? He sat up, resting on his elbow, and looked into her calm, beautiful face. How did this happen? And why are you so surprised? Isabella smirked. Don't you know that activities like the ones we enjoy often lead to such consequences? Of course, I know, he impatiently squinted and touched her hair, as if to make sure she was real. But you never said you wanted a child. Who said I did? She made a disappointed grimace. It just happened by chance. And what do you plan to do now? He cautiously asked. What about you? She looked at him intently. I don't know, Gerald was confused. It's up to you to decide. You men are all the same, Isabella said, half seriously, half jokingly. You're always up for acrobatics in bed, but when it comes to dealing with the consequences, you run away and hide. Wait, wait, he tried to hold her, but she twisted away and wrapped herself in the sheet before slipping away from him into the bathroom. 
She was gone for quite a while. He had enough time to get dressed and think. He gazed pensively out of the window and went downstairs to make coffee for both of them. Finally, she arrived too, already styled, dressed as if she was going out. Are you going somewhere? Gerald asked. Of course, she nodded. To the gynecologist. But. He looked at her, concerned, not finishing his sentence. What's a but? Isabella replied, squinting as she met his gaze. It seems you have no intention of becoming a father. Why should I become a mother then? I don't plan on raising a child alone. At that moment, something clicked in Gerald's mind, and he hugged her tightly. Isabella. Forgive me, please. Isabella. It was so unexpected. Of course, I'm happy. Extremely happy. You know, Vanessa and I have no children, and we never will. And? She moved away, looking into his eyes intently. I will get divorced, and we will get married, Gerald said firmly. We will have a real family. Isabella's face brightened, and she smiled at him with a tender and charming smile. That's exactly what I hope to hear from the beginning, but I must warn you, I'm not one to wait for years. The time is still very short, and an abortion can be done up to 12 weeks. So, you have about a month and a half to move in with me with your things, so to speak. I'm not so naive as to believe you'll manage the divorce in that time. She hastened to interrupt him when she saw he was about to say something. It will be enough if you tell your wife and leave her, and then you file for divorce. I assume after that, she's unlikely to take you back. I don't intend to go back to her now. He frowned slightly but didn't protest against Isabella's conditions. I will do everything as you say, my dear. He needed a few days to get used to this idea. A father. He would become a father. He would have a child. His own child. A son or a daughter. Oh, what does it matter? The most important thing is that it's his flesh and blood. A little continuation of himself. Vanessa was absolutely right when she said that he only wanted his own child. Now he realized it fully. However, despite everything, telling his wife about everything turned out to be challenging. He tried several times, but whenever he met her honest and open gaze, he immediately changed the subject or joked. Never mind, never mind. You look beautiful today, Vanessa. Don't worry, let's go have dinner. As if sensing his indecisiveness, fate or perhaps coincidence decided to take matters into its own hands. One fine spring morning, one of Vanessa's longtime clients came to her salon. Conveniently settled facing each other, they began a complicated artistic manicure procedure, chatting about everything under the sun, as usual. How is Vanessa doing with her husband? How's the treatment going? The client asked. She had never seen Gerald since their friendship with Vanessa had been limited to the confines of the manicure room for many years. Not very well, Vanessa sighed, wrapping the woman's fingers in foil, and fell silent, not wanting to share the details. Oh, don't worry so much. It might still work out. You know how life is? I have a close friend who went through something similar. In her youth, she had an abortion, and the doctors told her she would never have children under any circumstances. She said she didn't even think about it for many years. She never got married, had a couple of unpleasant experiences with men, all jerks, as luck would have it. Anyway, recently she met a very interesting man, the client continued, not stopping to chat, and Vanessa listened to her with half an ear while concentrating on her work. So, listen. The client went on. They dated for a few months, and everything was great. Then, a couple of weeks ago, she noticed she had missed her period. She went to the gynecologist, thinking she might have some illness. And then, boom. She's pregnant. Can you imagine, Vanessa, after all those years? Your friend was lucky, Vanessa smiled half-heartedly. Yes, these things happen, the client enthusiastically continued. And the man turned out to be a good and decent person. He's planning to divorce his wife and marry Isabella because they'll have a child together and he doesn't have children with his wife. 
she's been undergoing treatments for years, with no results. Such a waste of money. Oh. Suddenly, the client caught herself and bit her tongue. I'm sorry, Vanessa. I didn't mean to. You don't think about it. It's all right, Vanessa calmly replied, long used to her chatty friend. Sit still, please, don't move your hand. Okay, fine, the satisfied client calmed down. How about I show you photos of Isabella's guy? He's such a masculine man, you'll be impressed. But where are they? She sent them to me recently. Here they are, she said, joyfully finding the photos and handing Vanessa her phone. Look, isn't he handsome? Vanessa's eyes darkened. On the smartphone screen, Gerald was smiling while embracing another woman, an elegant platinum blonde who stood turned half away with her face mostly obscured by windblown hair. Vanessa, what's wrong? The client was surprised. Seeing her friend jump up, almost knocking the phone away, and rushing out in a hurry. I don't feel well. I'll be right back, she mumbled with a choked voice, flung open the doors, and hurriedly left the room. The bewildered client remained seated in the chair with splayed fingers. Who will turn on the lamp for me? She shrugged. Sorry, Betsy, one of the employees entered the room. Vanessa isn't feeling well. You know, she takes pills by the handful. I'll finish your nails for you. Today, I must tell her. I must, Gerald was preparing himself as he drove home. Damn. How should I say it? However, he didn't get the chance to say anything. When he entered the apartment, he found that almost all of his wife's belongings were gone, and there was a note on the table. I know everything. I'll be at the country house until you clear the apartment. My lawyer will send you the divorce papers. He let out a heavy sigh and sat down next to the table, reading and rereading the simple and concise note. So, everything was settled without him. But how did she find out? Could it be that Isabella told her? It doesn't seem like her. But if so, how will she regard him now? As a coward who couldn't bring himself to tell his wife he wanted a divorce? Perhaps that's what he is, a coward and a scoundrel. Gerald's heart tightened as he imagined Vanessa's feelings at this moment. With an effort of will, he pushed away this distressing image and started to pack his things hurriedly. As far as he understood, Isabella was not aware of how his wife found out about them. He couldn't bring himself to ask her directly, and she just smiled lightly, keeping her usual impenetrable expression when she saw him at the door with his suitcase. You can use the other half of the wardrobe, she said. And put the suitcase in the storeroom. That was it. Life divided into before and after. Two weeks later, the divorce papers arrived via email. Since they had no children, either side bothered to dispute property, and they were divorced fairly quickly. Gerald, unwilling to encounter his ex-wife anywhere, also sought the services of a lawyer to handle the paperwork. Well, darling. He said one evening, smiling at Isabella as he uncorked an expensive bottle of champagne. You can congratulate me, now I'm completely free and can offer you not only my love but everything else I have. He got closer to her and took out a little velvet box from his pocket. Isabella. My beloved. Will you marry me? She looked at the ring, smiling silently, not saying anything. He waited patiently, having grown accustomed to her leisurely manner. It's beautiful. Isabella finally said, turning the ring on her finger. But do we really need to get married? What do you mean? Gerald faltered halfway through the sentence. What about our child? You can be a father without being married to its mother, Isabella calmly replied. Don't you want to be my wife? Gerald was disappointed. I think a couple of extra papers won't change anything in our relationship, Isabella smiled. Will you love me more if I become your wife on paper? Of course not, Gerald assured her passionately. But it's for the sake of our child. You can give him or her your last name and be a good father. That will be enough. Let's not dwell on this conversation anymore. As you wish, my dear. Gerald agreed obediently. Everyone has their own sad or happy story and their life experiences. 
Isabella had her own history as well. Before meeting Gerald, she had already become disillusioned with men and people in general from an early age. Fate had not been kind to her. Her parents divorced when she was young, and she hardly remembered her biological father. Instead, she vividly remembered her stepfather, who had raped her, taking advantage of her mother's absence. His breath reeking of alcohol, he ordered her to keep quiet about it so things wouldn't get worse. When Isabella tearfully told her mother everything, her mother scowled disgustingly and said. What absurd stories you're making up. I can see perfectly well that you can't stand Irving, and you can't wait for him to leave us. But now you've gone too far, my dear. You're just like your father. Just as deceitful and wicked. Mom. How can you say that? Isabella cried. He raped me, and you're defending him. Do you think I'm lying? Let's go to the doctor. Let them confirm that I'm not deceiving you. What? Go to the doctor? You want to shame me in front of everyone, don't you? Besides, I've long suspected that you've been fooling around with the local boys, fluttering your eyes at them shamelessly when you come out of the entrance. Do you think I'm blind? If by any chance you got pregnant by one of them, rest assured I'll throw you out just like your lousy father, you bastard. I don't need liars around here. Mom. Why are you doing this? Isabella was hysterical and could hardly speak, choking on her tears. Her mother grabbed her by the collar and dragged her into the room, locking the latch. Sit here and think about your behavior. Maybe a couple of days under house arrest will teach you a lesson. Since that time, Isabella closed herself off and never told her mother anything again. She learned to defend herself against her stepfather, taking a knife from the kitchen and hiding it under her pillow. Once, when she heard the door creak in her room at night and heard his heavy footsteps and foul breath again, Isabella retrieved the hidden weapon and unexpectedly leaped from her bed like a panther. In the light of a street lamp, her steel blade glinted. Don't come any closer, or I'll scream, and mother will wake up. You little brat. The stepfather hissed but didn't dare to engage. He turned around and left. At the age of 16, Isabella left home and never returned. She hid in various corners and hostels, encountering different people on her path, mostly vile and despicable. Life seemed to deliberately present her with the worst examples of humanity, forging Isabella's character. This strategy proved to be effective. As an adult, Isabella became as cold and unyielding as steel. She inherited her father's beauty, much to the chagrin of her plain mother, who had always reproached Isabella for resembling her father. Those eyes are already cat-like. Why do you wear makeup? Be ashamed, only prostitutes paint their faces like that. And your lips. Dear God, forgive me. With such lips, you'll only work as a whore. You shouldn't paint them, instead, try to make them as inconspicuous as possible. Remember my words. With your appearance, nobody will take you seriously. Try to hide it. With such a flashy exterior, you'll only get into trouble. In some ways, her mother was right. Starting her independent life, Isabella quickly realized that men saw her as a beautiful but naive toy. And women envied and despised her, considering such beauties as herself to be promiscuous whores. Unfortunately, besides her mother, Isabella had no other family and didn't know her father. He had moved to another city after the divorce, but her mother never told her exactly where. He made no attempt to find his daughter either. Apparently, like everyone else, he didn't care about her. Naturally, like any person, especially a young girl, Isabella initially hoped for the best, for human kindness, and for all the good that still exists in this world. She hoped for a miracle, finally. That if she, Isabella, became a good person, acted properly, worked hard, treated everyone she met kindly, followed the principles of humanity, and so on, she might be rewarded. Without going into too many details, it has to be acknowledged that these hopes were not realized. The men Isabella encountered only sought to use her, and women tried to harm her. In the end, she closed herself off, grew hardened, and began to behave the same way stepping over others and extracting only personal gain from everything. 
Without a higher education and barely finishing school, she accidentally got a job at a real estate agency. The lowest position as the director's secretary. Of course, she was not hired for exceptional knowledge and abilities, but only for her striking appearance. Her immediate supervisor had intentions to use his new secretary for his direct purpose, but Isabella, familiar with the dark side of life since childhood, no longer had rosy illusions. She just tightened her grip on her straight white teeth and tried to use this situation to her advantage. Her boss appreciated her docility, started paying her well, and even allowed her to study the craft with the sales department. He didn't expect much. As long as the girl stayed with him and didn't try to leave until he grew tired of her. However, Isabella surprised him quite a bit. From the very beginning, she brought real clients to the firm. She enjoyed the work and threw herself into all the intricacies of real estate. Taking it up with such enthusiasm because she realized it was her chance to achieve independence. To take control of her own destiny. To finally live according to her own rules. Very soon, she became an example for other employees. Within a year, she was promoted to a senior manager and then became the deputy head of the sales department. Perhaps she could have climbed the ladder up to the branch director, but ambitious Isabella decided to take a different path. She charmed a wealthy and elderly client, married him, and used his money to start her own firm. Thankfully, no special education was required for this. It's surprising how gullible people can be, ready to entrust all their money to private firms under bright signs, often without any basis. Hoping that they will receive professional assistance. Truthful by nature, Isabella never stooped to deceit. The standard income from her company was enough for her. The fees that realtors often pocket without bothering to declare them in tax returns were substantial during Isabella's youth. Even without considering her elderly husband's fortune, she became quite a wealthy woman. It seemed like she had finally obtained everything she desired. She had independence and sufficient means to live a comfortable life without burdening her aging husband. Of course, she didn't love him. Though, she was somewhat grateful to him for providing the financial foundation. Yet, something still troubled her. It wasn't unrequited love or tenderness she couldn't give away. Isabella didn't have a single truly close person. Twelve years ago, she had an abortion after becoming pregnant with her boss. The pregnancy was already quite advanced, and the procedure was not smooth. After that, something went wrong in her body, and merciless fate struck Isabella again. The doctors, to whom she turned for help as a financially successful woman, unanimously diagnosed her with secondary infertility. They didn't even recommend in vitro fertilization, believing her body wouldn't accept the procedure, and the implanted embryos wouldn't survive. Proud by nature, Isabella didn't attempt to conceive a child through artificial means. The idea of someone else's hands intruding into her body and using someone else's biomaterial as the basis of her motherhood, repulsed her. No, she didn't need that kind of happiness. Adopting a child from an orphanage was also a questionable idea, to be honest. A stranger would always remain a stranger, never becoming her own. It was Isabella's principled position. Thus, she also crossed motherhood off her list, just like love. But unexpectedly, love eventually caught up with her. There was something about this polite, intelligent, and handsome man, the director of the construction company she approached to build a new country house. By that time, her elderly husband had already departed this world, and Isabella had been without a lover for quite some time. Apparently, fate aligned the stars in such a way that this person managed to reach her impenetrable ice queen. Of course, it wasn't easy, and he turned out to be married, but Isabella now knew very well what she wanted and how to achieve it. She knew that under no circumstances should a man, no matter how much she liked him, see her weakness. Otherwise, he would immediately use and discard her, or at best, simply lose interest. So, she didn't let Gerald get too close to her, didn't reveal her soul to him. They didn't even talk, especially about anything serious. They chatted and laughed, of course. And they had sex, very often and a lot. Gerald turned out to be so good in bed that Isabella simply lost her mind and did her best not to fall for him head over heels. Although, it seems she couldn't prevent that from happening. 
And then, when she unexpectedly discovered that she was pregnant, it was both a gift from the cruel fate that had tormented her until now and a low blow. What to do now? How to tell him? How will he react to this fact? Will he think she used him or be happy about it? Will he go back to his wife, scared of the responsibility, or will he become more attached to her and be a good father? Isabella didn't know the answers to these questions, but she didn't expect anything good out of habit. Eventually, she decided to act as if she didn't care what he would do. To remain as cold and unapproachable as the real Ice Queen. And surprisingly, this strategy worked once again. Gerald left his wife, genuinely left her, and got divorced. Then he made a real proposal with a ring and a touching speech, as it should be. For a moment, Isabella even allowed herself to think that finally, a bright streak in her life had come, and she had been granted a bit of simple human happiness. But at the last moment, her old habit of doing things her way prevailed, and Isabella chose to remain independent. What use were these papers and stamps in her passport? She had been married before and had been dependent on men many times. She didn't want to become someone else's possession again, and Gerald accepted that. He was just happy to become a father. He moved in with her, and they began to live together like a truly happy couple, eagerly anticipating the birth of their child. Her newlywed husband cared for her so tenderly, eagerly awaiting the baby's arrival, that at times Isabella was almost ready to believe in his sincere feelings. Though, each time she regained her senses. No, she thought, she couldn't relax, couldn't let herself believe in happiness. Fate, that wicked villain, would strike again. That's why she continued to behave rather reservedly and keep her beloved at a distance. Gerald, on the other hand, seemed not to notice. He was completely consumed by the preparations for the upcoming birth of their heir. He started a complete renovation in the part of the house where the little one was supposed to settle. They still didn't know if it would be a son or a daughter. Isabella, skeptical of medical predictions, didn't rush to undergo standard checkups or even register with a maternity clinic, claiming that there was still time. In reality, she was filled with fear inside. What if something went wrong? And she couldn't bring herself to visit a doctor without a pressing need. Nothing hurt anywhere, her belly was gradually growing, and the baby had already started kicking inside for a few weeks. When Isabella felt it for the first time, she almost screamed in surprise. It was such a strong and vivid sensation. Placing her hand on her belly, she retreated to the bathroom, and only there, sitting on a fluffy rug, she let her emotions flow. She cried like a young girl, caressing her swollen belly and whispering various tender and foolish words to her little one. You are my good one. You are the most beloved. My little one. Sweetie. You will be the happiest in the world, and I will make sure of that. Trust me, your mother will never let anyone hurt you, my dear, my tiny one. You are so defenseless right now, but don't be afraid. Everything will be fine. Pouring her soul out like this, Isabella softened slightly. She even allowed Gerald to touch her belly, and she laughed when he, in turn, started making funny sounds and faces to communicate with the future heir. But the feeling of an impending catastrophe still didn't leave her completely. In the end, she simply forbade herself from thinking about anything negative and tried to focus entirely on her future child. Together with Gerald, they chose wallpapers for the nursery. They planned how they would take care of their little one which agency they would approach to find a suitable nanny. They designated not just one room but an entire floor of their mansion for the child's personal space. A separate bathroom with a small toilet, a bath in the shape of a little ship, a low sink, and cheerful patterned tiles suitable for both a girl and a boy were installed. They also decorated the bedroom and created a huge playroom with a floor-to-ceiling window, closed with a glassed-in balcony, to make it bright and safe. Listen, Isabella, Gerald said to her one evening during dinner. I've chosen a few names here. Take a look. How do you like them? Isabella silently took the offered list, quickly skimmed through it, wrinkled her pretty nose slightly, and then smiled. Well, I like this one, she said. Really? Oswald? That's my favorite too. And for a girl? For a girl, I'm not sure. I don't think any of these names suit. 
Then choose one yourself, darling. I'm open to anything. Let's see first what our baby will be like, Isabella smiled. And then we'll decide on the name. You know, it's a bad omen to prepare everything in advance. Let's leave the name for later. All right, of course, Gerald tenderly embraced his wife. I'm sure everything will be fine. We will give birth in the best clinic, and you will be taken care of at the highest level. Don't worry, I'll be there for you all the time. No. Isabella suddenly said sharply. I don't want you to be present during the delivery. Why? Gerald raised his brows in a plaintive manner. It's a silly tradition to allow men into such a process. I've never given birth, of course. But I know enough to understand that there is very little pleasant about it. Blood, pain, and fear, that's all, Isabella said firmly. But I want to help you so you won't be afraid, Gerald tried to convince her. Don't even think about it, she said sharply. I can handle it perfectly well on my own. Even the attending doctor, whom she had chosen, wholeheartedly supported this decision. I wouldn't recommend inviting your husband into the delivery room, believe me. You are absolutely right. The sight of a beloved woman screaming in intense pain has never made anyone more passionate and loving. Many even faint from what they see and then need psychological therapy on top of that. Men are fragile creatures, they need to be protected, the doctor added with a laugh. I completely agree with you, Isabella smiled. I think we understand each other perfectly. This conversation took place when there was still about a month left until the actual delivery. Isabella finally underwent all the necessary examinations, tests, and other procedures required for admission to the maternity hospital. She only requested not to be informed about the baby's gender in advance. Let it be a surprise, Isabella smiled. I don't want to know beforehand. That's your right, the doctor agreed. But you still need to undergo an ultrasound to check on the baby's condition. Isabella was forced to agree. They laid her on a couch covered with a disposable sheet, applied a cold, slippery gel to her large belly, and the ultrasound specialist doctor began to move the elongated joystick over her abdomen. Do you want to turn the monitor so you can see your little one, the doctor smiled. No, there's no need. Isabella requested and was about to add that she didn't want to see or know anything in advance to avoid any unnecessary revelations, but she hesitated when she saw the doctor's frowning face. What? Is something wrong with the baby, the expectant mother worried and tried to sit up to catch a glimpse of the monitor. Lie down, lie down, the doctor gently reassured her. There's no reason to worry. The computer is just hanging up, taking some time to process the data. Isabella relaxed and reclined back on the couch. The rhythmic humming of the ultrasound machine in the semi-darkness lulled her, and she almost fell asleep while the doctor continued her examination. Wake up, mom, the doctor woke her with a chuckle. Here's the disc with the recording, the results will be explained by your attending doctor. Looking at the results, the attending doctor also frowned. You need to do additional tests, she finally said. Why? Can you tell me what's wrong with my baby?" Isabella asked, almost in tears, suspecting that the doctors were hiding some negative information from her. If I could be sure, I would definitely tell you, the doctor assured her. For now, I can only see that you have low amniotic fluid levels. It's a risk factor. You need to be admitted to the clinic immediately. It's possible that we'll have to induce labor earlier than expected. Oh, dear. Isabella paled. Calm down, said the doctor. You're not the first to experience this. Sometimes it happens, and in most cases, it's easily treatable. If you keep getting so nervous, you'll only do more harm to yourself and, most importantly, to your baby. In the end, she was admitted to the clinic, placed in the maternity pathology department. Worried by such news, Gerald brought all the necessary belongings and they sat together for a long time in a separate comfortable room, for which he generously paid the established tariff. Gerald tried to calm his beloved. If there was anything serious, they would have operated on you right away. I just talked to your doctor. She said you'll stay here for observation. She said there's no danger to the baby's life. 
They'll monitor everything. Hang in there, darling. I'll come to see you every day. Finally, reassured Isabella, who also received relaxing injections, fell asleep in her new temporary refuge. Gerald left. He had reassured his wife, but his heart felt constricted by a certain unpleasant premonition. He had barely parked the car in the garage when he heard his phone ringing from the inner pocket. He frantically took it out, thinking it was Isabella with urgent news. But the call was from Vanessa. Surprised, he answered the call. Hello? Hi, Gerald, her voice was perfectly calm. We need to meet and discuss something important. When can you make it? Maybe tomorrow at the cafe near the tower? Okay, he replied automatically, his thoughts still preoccupied with something else. What time? Let's meet around lunchtime, about 2 o'clock. Will that work for you? All right, I'll be there, he answered and added, how are you doing? Everything's good, thanks, her voice sounded even and satisfied. See you, and Vanessa hung up. Gerald continued to stare at the TV screen for a long time, engulfed in sudden waves of memories. Many years ago, he and Vanessa were so happy. He recalled those unforgettable years of their early youth in the dormitory. How poor they were, like church mice, but how they knew how to enjoy life. From the very beginning, they had tender, trusting relationships. They were not just lovers, then spouses, they were true friends. They could tell each other everything, even the simplest or most secret things, chat about everything in the world, and laugh without any reason. Where had all of that gone? Through which unnoticed crack in their family ship had their sparkling happiness leaked away, drop by drop? But with Isabella, even though he sincerely admired her, such close and friendly relations never seemed to happen. She was always cold and unapproachable, like the Snow Queen. Gerald never knew exactly what was on her mind. She simply didn't let him get close to her, always maintaining a certain distance that she herself set. In bed, she was amazing, no words. But having a real conversation was impossible. When they were together, Isabella would remain mysteriously silent, sometimes smiling condescendingly, as if Gerald was a creature of lower order compared to her. He couldn't tell her how his day went, share his plans and dreams. And what's more, he knew nothing about her past. Gerald suspected that there was some sorrow in her life baggage, which made her keep her distance from people, even from the closest ones. At times, he felt hurt that the person with whom she was planning to spend her life and even have a child didn't deserve, in her opinion, to be allowed into her complex inner world. But today, for the first time, he saw genuine emotion in her. She was scared, in a panic, fearing for their baby's life and health. This both reassured and captivated Gerald. It meant that she wasn't completely unfeeling if she cared so deeply. Perhaps it hadn't been long enough, and as soon as she gives birth, she'll thaw. The cafe where Vanessa had arranged to meet him was called, At the Tower. The name was explained by the location of the place. It was situated next to either an old Catholic church or the town hall. Gerald never really knew much about architecture. In reality, this tower was one of the main city landmarks. From the top, there was a breathtaking view of the entire old town, and countless excursions of curious tourists went to the town hall. According to their custom associated with this tower, newlyweds had to climb to the very top, where the bell tower used to be in ancient times, but was now empty and abandoned. They had to climb the steep and high, narrow stone spiral staircase, only designed for one person, while holding hands. It was believed that if they reached the top without ever letting go of each other's hands, they would spend their whole lives together until old age. On their wedding day, Gerald and Vanessa had also not escaped this peculiar quest. Hold on tight, he told her then, and he squeezed her small palm so tightly that Vanessa let out a little scream. You what? That hurts, she laughed immediately, pleased with how strong her husband was. They almost made it to the very top, not releasing their hands on the narrow and uncomfortable staircase, only meant for one person. But right at the last second, when the delicate fingers of the young wife were about to slip out of her husband's large hand, Gerald made a desperate leap and grabbed Vanessa's sleeve of her wedding dress as if with a claw, and then immediately caught her hand again. Hold on. Oops. 
Vanessa managed to scream before hanging on Gerald's neck. Her head was spinning from fright. Thank you for saving me. I'll always hold you. I'll never let you go anywhere, he promised her on that distant day. Gerald remembered all of this while sitting in the cafe, waiting for Vanessa, and involuntarily sighed, almost regretting the past. This was their favorite meeting place from long ago, and she was late again as she always was, making him nervous and looking at the clock. Gerald had planned to stop by work and then go visit Isabella in the hospital, and finally, his ex-wife appeared. From behind the counter with beverages, he spotted only her graceful head. A new hairstyle. Did she let her hair down again, like in her youth? Against his will, he admired Vanessa. She somehow looked fresher. Her face became smooth and rosy. Had she gained weight? Definitely, but it only suited her. And when she walked closer through the hall and came into full view, Gerald let out a light whistle of surprise. Vanessa was pregnant. Her huge belly no longer fit under the light spring coat. Undoubtedly, she was already very far along in her pregnancy. Approximately the same as Isabella's. Her weight was coming to an end. Hello, Gerald, she said with a smile, approaching closely and pushing the chair back, trying to sit down awkwardly. Her large belly was bothering her, and it probably even hurt because she winced slightly and grabbed the table with her hand. Gerald quickly got up and supported her elbow, helping her to sit. Are you okay? Yes, everything is fine, she nodded and placed her hand on her belly. For a few seconds, Gerald remained silent, unable to find the right words, and thousands of thoughts swirled in his head. Vanessa, in turn, looked at him mischievously, almost triumphantly, and smiled slightly. Finally, unable to bear the pause any longer, she spoke first. Don't worry. He's not yours. What do you mean? Gerald raised his eyebrows in surprise. Gerald didn't quite understand what he felt at her words. Relief or disappointment? Perhaps both. Oh, he started, but Vanessa interrupted him, continuing her sentence. He doesn't have a father at all. He was conceived through a final procedure, using donor material. Understand? Two embryos settled, but unfortunately, one of them turned out to be non-viable. A slight shadow fell on her face, but she quickly pushed it away and smiled happily. But the second one, as you can see, is perfectly fine. Congratulations, Gerald mumbled in a colorless tone. And how about you? Me? She seemed surprised by his question. I'm happy, Gerald. I'll finally have a child. Can't you see? He had seen it the moment she entered the hall. Even without knowing, he had already seen that expression of absolute happiness on her now rosy face. She was so happy that it almost felt tangible, as if happiness could be touched. I'm happy for you, he tried to smile, but it came out crooked. Why does it hurt so much, he suddenly thought. His heart constricted as if he had been personally deeply offended. We will soon have a child with Isabella too, he reminded himself, but strangely, it didn't make him feel any better. This is actually why I invited you to meet, Vanessa said, while he was still lost in his thoughts. Why? Gerald was surprised. He's not mine. You said so yourself. Yes, Vanessa patiently explained. But he was conceived during the period of our marriage, from a legal point of view, we were not officially divorced then. Do you understand? Although we were no longer living together. The lawyer said I need a document from you. So please sign it, stating that you don't claim paternity. Why? Gerald was puzzled. He's not mine, as you said. Yes, Vanessa nodded. But he was conceived during the time we were married, legally speaking. We weren't officially divorced back then, even though we were no longer living together. The lawyer said I need a document from you. So please sign it, stating that you don't claim paternity. Okay, Gerald said distractedly, scanning the document Vanessa handed him, and signed it at the end. Is it fine? Yes, thank you very much, she said as if she were talking about returning a ticket or something equally utilitarian. Well, I'll go. Nice to see you. 
Her tone was calm, even businesslike. She waved at him and left the cafe. Sitting at the table, Gerald watched through the large window as a yellow checkered taxi stopped at the entrance, and the driver opened the door to help her get in. How will she manage alone with the child, he wondered. She didn't even ask how I was doing. The next thought was unexpected. He felt annoyed that she dismissed him so quickly, without even figuring out his feelings. He paid the bill and left the cafe to continue with the rest of his plans for the day. Late in the evening, Gerald received another unexpected call on his phone. This time from a longtime friend, whom they had been friends with since their school days. Gerald, he said cheerfully over the phone. I'm passing through here, just for a couple of days. I just got off the plane. I'll get some duty-free whiskey and come straight to you. Is the address the same? No. The address has changed, Gerald replied. A lot of things have changed, actually. Come on, Mark, of course. I'll send you the coordinates now. So that's how you've settled down, Mark laughed an hour later, hugging Gerald and patting him on the back. Hey, buddy. Hey, hey. So, let me in. Gerald accepted a large rustling package from his friend, filled with bottles and snacks. I'm alone now. My wife is in the maternity ward, he said. Wow, exclaimed his friend. So you've become a dad? Not yet, Gerald smiled. We're expecting any day now. Well, that's a good thing. The right thing to do. Send my regards to Vanessa. Finally, you guys are reproducing, Mark announced loudly and joyfully, waving his arms in all directions. Listen, there's something you should know, said Gerald, and seeing his friend's widened eyes, he led him to the kitchen. Let's go, I'll tell you everything. After having quite a few drinks, the friends sat facing each other and shared their life problems. You know, Gerald, you shouldn't be angry with fate, I'm telling you, Mark insisted. You have two women, and each gives you a child. Meanwhile, my idiot of a son is almost grown up, and he still has no brains, just like his mother. He wrecked his car to pieces last year. Can you imagine? Well, all right. I think it happens in life. I bought him another car, took a loan for it, especially since he works as a taxi driver, so he needs a car. And he took that car and wrecked it too. And it was almost the same accident. Life doesn't teach the idiot anything, and I have to pay off the loan for a piece of metal. Yeah, not like the son I have with Isabella, but the one with Vanessa, Gerald said firmly, looking through the bottle glass. I told you. There's no father there. I'm telling you. It's from donor sperm. That's the whole father. Oh, come on. Mark exclaimed, slightly tipsy. They've gone so far that soon they'll be growing children in test tubes from start to finish. I don't know about the whole process, Gerald said. But using donor material has been done for a long time. I myself gave this biomaterial for several years, and with Isabella, it worked on the first try, right on target, you know? I get it, Mark agreed. Well, let's drink to your heir. Is it a son or a daughter? We don't know. We haven't checked yet, Gerald sighed and hiccuped. Isabella doesn't want to know in advance. Let me show you her picture instead. Look, this is my Isabella. Beautiful, right? Beautiful? Mark concurred again. And Vanessa was beautiful too. In my opinion, both of them are great. Why did you even get divorced? You could have played both sides, and he winked mischievously at his friend. Come on, man, Gerald waved his hand, throwing an innocent phone somewhere behind the couch. Let's pour more. While the men were blowing off steam in this way, the following events took place at the clinic where Isabella was. Around 2 o'clock in the morning, she started having contractions, and her water broke almost immediately. A drowsy and dissatisfied doctor, called from home, examined the expectant mother and said curtly, emergency cesarean, right away. I don't want a cesarean. We didn't agree on that. Isabella protested, groaning in pain. Do you want to endanger the baby? The doctor asked angrily. No. 
then do as you're told. If you don't do this now, he'll suffocate from hypoxia, and then you can discuss your agreements. With the current indications, there's nothing to think about. Prep her for premedication and get her to the table. We'll cut her open. With trembling fingers, Isabella tapped her smartphone screen, trying to call Gerald, but all attempts were in vain. The call was going through, but there was no response. He found the time to sleep. Isabella thought angrily and groaning, she struggled to climb into the wheelchair that had been brought for her. Fifteen minutes later, she inhaled the laughing gas from the transparent mask, counted to three, and the tiled white walls began to swirl and dissolve, giving way to sparkling distant realms where she flew with joy and excitement, feeling as free as a bird. With a heavy head and eyes weighed down as if with sand, Gerald woke up after a night of drinking at eleven in the morning the next day. Bright sunlight streamed through the partially drawn curtains. Birds chirped like crazy, and the delicate scent of blooming lilacs tickled his nostrils. Struggling to get up, Gerald made his way to the kitchen, drinking water from the clean tap to quench his thirst. He peeked into the guest room, where Mark was still sleeping peacefully, and checking the time, he panicked. Darn it. I need to be at the office by half past twelve, he muttered. Hastily putting on his clothes, Gerald searched frantically for his phone in all the corners, cursing profusely. Finally, he found the elusive gadget under the sofa cushion, checked the missed calls, and was horrified once more. There were twelve missed calls from Isabella. He quickly dialed her number, but the connection was unavailable. No longer caring about anything else, Gerald rushed out of the house, slamming the door, jumped into his car, and sped off to the clinic. I'm in the pathological ward. In the private room, to Mrs. Taylor, he said, rushing into the reception area and informing the administrator right away. Where are you rushing to, shouted the nurse on duty from the ward. Wait. Stop. Mrs. Taylor has been transferred to the ICU. The doctor herself came and said to let her husband know when he shows up. Are you her husband? I am, Gerald agreed. Only then did he comprehend the monstrous information and turned pale. Why to the ICU? What happened? You'll find out the details from the doctor, the woman said dryly, sitting back down on her chair. Gerald rushed around the floors, trying to find the attending physician. Seeing his desperation, the nurses at the pathology station said, Margot Phillips is in a complex surgery now. You won't find her until 3 o'clock, and there's no point in calling her either. She won't pick up the phone. Where is my wife? Gerald asked plaintively, slightly calmed by the news about the baby. Your wife gave birth to a boy yesterday, 50 centimeters tall, weighing 2.7 kilograms, one of the employees checked the records in the journal. She's in the ICU now after the cesarean. Everything is fine. Don't worry. You'll see each other tomorrow. Family members can't go to the ICU, no one is allowed. And the baby? Gerald asked, feeling a bit relieved. The baby is fine too. He's in the postnatal box. He received his first vaccine. The mother signed the consent form. Tomorrow they'll both be transferred to another room and you'll see them there. What should I do today then? Gerald asked, confused once again, pacing in one spot. Go home, rest. You look pale from stress, the nurses laughed. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Here, take this, Gerald hastily searched his pockets. I'm sorry, I came empty-handed. He handed them some crumpled bills. Buy something for yourselves, have a drink to my family's health. Thank you, but it's not necessary. Stop it. We can't have anything stronger than coffee at work, the women protested, but they took the money. Thank you, now really go. Come back tomorrow, straight to your room. On wobbly legs, hardly aware of his surroundings, Gerald made it outside and collapsed on a bench near the entrance of the clinic. He took out a cigarette but immediately dropped it upon encountering the fierce glare of some elderly orderly. Sir. No smoking here. Okay, okay. It wasn't a time to argue with the grandmas. Gerald couldn't even remember how he got home. Nor could he recall Mark leaving. 
because on the next day, when he arrived at the clinic in the early morning, everything spun again, and life split in two once more. In the hospital room, Gerald found Isabella in tears, with a stony expression on her face, but the baby wasn't next to her. Isabella, my dear, he rushed to her with a gorgeous bouquet of flowers. Darling, forgive me. I didn't hear your calls the day before yesterday. Congratulations to you and our little one on the birth. There's not much to congratulate us on, Isabella said bitterly, looking away, staring at a fixed point. What do you mean? Gerald asked, his voice faltering. At that moment, the door to the room opened, and the attending physician walked in. Are you the father? she asked from the threshold, not even greeting them. I am, Gerald confirmed, feeling flustered. Come with me to my office, the woman requested. We need to discuss something. That's how Gerald found out that their son was born with severe disabilities. He had Edwards syndrome, characterized by multiple congenital abnormalities, the doctor explained to Gerald, who sat in silence in her office. Specifically, your baby has brain abnormalities, deformities of facial and cranial bones, and developmental defects in the musculoskeletal and cardiovascular systems. He is currently on a ventilator. Can I see him? Gerald asked softly. Of course, the doctor nodded. You and your wife need to make a decision soon about his care. This is our own son, and we will never surrender him to an orphanage, Gerald said firmly. The doctor looked at Gerald with unhidden pity and replied, you should see him first. Gerald shook his head, shot her an angry look, and left the office. She followed him, locked the door, and gestured for him to follow her to the elevator. On the eighth floor, in the neonatal pathology department, they dressed Gerald in a disposable suit, handed him a medical mask and gloves. Come in, a voice sounded from behind the wide double doors with large windows. Inside the glass-walled box, on a white sheet, lay a tiny body with unnaturally twisted arms and legs, a blue contorted face with a bruise-like discoloration on one side of the head. The slender thread on a monitor flashed green. Gerald understood that this was his son's life. Fragile, trembling, ready to break at any moment. Son, he approached, looking through the thick glass. Son, hang on. Your mom and I will always be by your side. The baby didn't move, didn't open his eyes, only one hand twitched weakly, as if pulled by a thread. My God. Up close, Gerald saw the horrifying details. The baby's skull seemed crushed on the left side. One ear was underdeveloped, and the legs and arms looked like they were pulled near the elbows and knees. He closed his eyes for a second. He felt nauseous. He turned around abruptly and left the large room, filled with glass cubes and cribs. Will he survive? Gerald hoarsely asked the doctor waiting for him outside the room. It's difficult to give any precise prognosis, the doctor replied. If he survives the first month, he will require very complex treatment. The best place for that would be a high-tech clinic abroad. In Germany or Israel, they know how to help such patients get back on their feet. But as for his cognitive abilities, that's even more complicated. You understand, right? Gerald fell silent, gathering his thoughts. Why did this happen? Who's to blame for him being born like this, he finally exhaled. There's no one to blame, the doctor shook her head. But you and your wife need to undergo genetic testing to determine your predisposition to hereditary diseases. It will help the doctors understand how to treat the child, of course, if you decide to keep him. Gerald took a labored breath. He felt suffocated, and his head was spinning. Everything that was happening felt like a terrible dream. He couldn't believe that the long-awaited and joyous expectation had turned into this tragedy. You need time, I understand, the doctor said, rising and walking down the corridor toward the elevator. The results of the complex genetic tests arrived three weeks later. During that time, Isabella and Gerald's baby remained in the clinic. His underdeveloped lungs prevented him from breathing on his own. Isabella had been discharged a long time ago, but at home, she lay more and more, gazing at the ceiling or smoking on the balcony. Isabella, let's go, have something to eat, Gerald urged her. But his beloved withdrew into herself and remained silent, rarely reacting to anything happening around her. 
She didn't even come out when the doctor, whom Gerald invited to their home, arrived, locking herself in the bathroom. Tell him to go to hell, she snarled angrily from behind the door, and heavy silence fell once again. She definitely needs antidepressants. I'll write you a prescription, the doctor said, leaving. The doctor issued the necessary documents. Try to persuade her to take them after all. Otherwise, her condition will only worsen and may develop into a prolonged depression, the doctor advised. But isn't she already depressed? Gerald shrugged. Right now, she's experiencing postnatal stress, complicated by the baby's condition, the doctor stated. We need to monitor and control her. On the same day, they received a call from the clinic, inviting the parents to meet with the head of the department. Well, what's the situation? Is there any hope? Gerald asked from the threshold as he entered the doctor's office. Hello? Where is the patient's mother, the gray-haired elderly doctor adjusted his glasses and looked at the man. She couldn't come, Gerald replied, averting his eyes. She's feeling very unwell. All right. For some reason, the doctor's expression grew even more serious, and he asked, are you already the official father of the newborn? Have you received the birth certificate? Yes, Gerald nodded. They asked me to bring it when they called from here. Good, the doctor nodded in satisfaction. Now I can discuss everything with you as the legal representative. However, it's better if you personally familiarize yourself with the obtained data. With a quick and nimble movement, he placed the stapled sheets in front of his visitor. Please read it. I hardly understand anything here, Gerald admitted after a few minutes of careful study of the document. His eyes were blurry. Reference values, prothrombin indices, erythrocyte sedimentation rate, some mysterious alleles. Look at the very end, the doctor advised gently. DNA samples, Gerald read aloud, skipping over completely incomprehensible terms. The result is strictly confidential. DNA was extracted from the samples provided by each participant in the study and was analyzed using a marker system. The alleged father is excluded as the biological father of the prenatal sample obtained from the mother. Gerald finished reading and was stunned, raising his eyebrows. I don't quite understand, he finally said, looking up at the doctor. Let me clarify, the doctor sighed. You are not the father. The simplicity and at the same time the monstrosity of this short sentence almost crushed Gerald. He felt a whirlwind of emotions that couldn't possibly be experienced all at once. Shame, anger, sadness, relief, pity, and probably much more, but at that moment, he couldn't analyze his feelings. He simply repeated the doctor's last words like an echo. Not the father? No, the doctor shook his head. Unless someone else provided blood samples for you. I provided them myself, Gerald almost shouted in desperation and immediately realized that his intense reaction was inappropriate. However, the doctor looked at him with sympathy rather than concern. It's all right, Gerald Taylor. You're not the first, so to speak, and you won't be the last. As a man, I understand you very well. Thank you, Gerald mechanically replied and stood there, not understanding what to do next. The doctor understood everything, but he did not. No. That means he is not my son, he finally exhaled and felt an uninvited joy spreading throughout his entire being. He is not the father of this monster. It's no longer his problem. Thank you, doctor, he shook the doctor's hand and quickly walked out of the office. You're welcome, the doctor replied in a colorless tone and placed the papers, which the visitor never picked up on top of the pile of documents on his desk. From personal experience, he knew that this man would soon return for evidence of his non-involvement in someone else's tragedy. Meanwhile, Gerald, upon reaching home, stormed into Isabella's bedroom. Get up. He rushed to the bed, grabbed her shoulders, and shook her vigorously. I said get up. What on earth is wrong with you? She looked at him with a mixture of surprise and anger. Come on, get up. Ignoring her resistance, Gerald literally pulled her out of bed by the collar and dragged her to the wardrobe. Get dressed. Gerald. Isabella exclaimed, completely shocked by what was happening. 
What's gotten into you? Oh, now you decide to talk? Gerald sneered spitefully. You even bothered to ask what's wrong with me? There's nothing left between us. Understand? You won't be able to deceive me anymore, you shameless bitch. Get dressed. Go to the hospital. Take your worthless bastard. They're discharging him finally. And by the way, Gerald falsely laughed in her face. By the way, I already know your little secret. Yes, he mockingly grinned, looking straight into her distorted eyes filled with bitterness and bewilderment. What do you have to say about that now? Yes, I know everything. You wanted to pin this monstrosity on me? You must be such a despicable creature. Fine if you tried to pass off a healthy child as mine, but this abomination? No, Gerald yelled with a malicious expression in his eyes and suddenly spat in her face. Bitch. A fire of wild fury blazed in Isabella's eyes. She raised her hand and slowly wiped her face. Get out of my house immediately, she demanded. Oh, you scared me, Gerald laughed. I won't stay here for another minute. Go to your bastard's real daddy, if you know who he is, of course. Gerald sneered triumphantly, and now I am free from you, from him, and from all of this nightmare. Goodbye. And he rushed out of the room like a stone released from a sling, slamming the door so hard that plaster fell from above. Isabella, still sitting on the floor near the wardrobe, doubled over in convulsions that gripped her entire body. How can this be, she angrily and demandingly asked the same doctor, shaking the research papers in front of his face. I am absolutely certain that he is the father. I haven't been with anyone else, do you hear me? No one else. How dare you claim that some dubious tests are more truthful than me? Calm down, woman. Calm down, the doctor, frightened by her reaction, instinctively cowered, trying to avoid a possible blow. These are very accurate tests. Trust me. I trust myself. Isabella exclaimed, tearing the papers in half. I only trust myself, and I advise you to do the same before tarnishing someone's honest name. Did you personally perform these tests? They were conducted in a specially equipped laboratory, of course, the doctor said. Then your laboratory made a mistake, Isabella threw the torn papers in the department head's face. See you in court. Back home with her deformed offspring and a specially hired nanny, Isabella wept bitterly for a long time, hiding in her bedroom. After washing her face and looking at her reflection in the mirror, she firmly told herself, enough of being a crybaby. Why did you think this time would be any different? Life has never been easy for us. This is just a new challenge. But luckily, I have the strength and resources to try to cope with this disaster. The biological father abandoned him, and the whole world will abandon him too if I don't help him resolutely. She went downstairs to the yard, where the indifferent nanny was rocking the stroller on the veranda and reading a softcover book. Meanwhile, Gerald, feeling relieved, went through a wild spree. He had never gone to such extremes before. His friends and companions were already starting to take decisive measures when one fine morning, he appeared at his office, clean-shaven, and wearing a fresh shirt. After gathering everyone for a meeting, he said, so, here's the deal. I'm leaving Lenny in charge indefinitely. All pending matters and other business will be handled by Lenny. I'll be working remotely. Today, exchange the bank cards with Lenny for the right of the first signature. If something important comes up, call anytime. Where are you going, Gerald Taylor? Even his super-responsible and meticulous assistant, Monica Edwards Denisovna, shed tears. I don't know yet, he shrugged and left the office. Since then, no one had seen Gerald personally for almost three years. Where had he been all this time? What was he doing? No one knew, not even Lenny. Nobody dared to ask during the short video communication sessions, and various rumors circulated. Some said he rented a villa in Italy to heal his emotional wounds. Others claimed he obtained residency in Israel and was living a carefree life. There were even rumors that he joined the French Foreign Legion and was fighting somewhere in the desert sands against Arabs. Vanessa sat on a bench in the city park, laughing as she watched the children playing in the sandbox. 
Careful, Ralph. Be careful, sweetheart. Don't throw the sand too high, you'll get it in your eyes, and others too. Oswald. Why are you just sitting there? Come on, let's build a sandcastle. Remember how we practiced? Three-year-old Ralph approached his brother and handed him a little shovel. Here. Oswald, who looked slightly younger than Ralph, awkwardly took the tools and nodded. Thanks. Use the yellow sand, Ralph advised with the air of an expert. It's the prettiest. Just don't eat it like last time, sand is tasteless, remember? Yeah, Oswald agreed, nodding again. Taking the shovel, he twisted the handle oddly and began filling the mold with sand. It was a difficult task for him, but he put in great effort, panting and grunting until he finally accomplished the task. With a smile that resembled more of a grimace, the boy proudly said, done. Well done, Oswald. My clever boy. Vanessa praised him. Now make one more. I'll take a picture of you with them. We'll show it to the doctor, okay? Okay, Oswald replied, reaching for the little shovel once more. Hello, Vanessa, a voice came from behind, and the woman turned quickly, recognizing him. Hi, she smiled, quickly overcoming her surprise at the unexpected encounter. What a surprise. Indeed. Gerald agreed. I thought you had only one child, you said so yourself. But now I see that you actually have two. The second one is not mine, Vanessa smiled again. Or, well, biologically, he is, but he's adopted. She calmly looked at her ex-husband, exuding such peace that Gerald felt a sharp pang of envy. Can I sit with you, he asked. Of course, she scooted over, making more space, and then immediately called out loudly, no. No. Oswald, don't break the sandcastles. We're going to take a picture of them now. Sorry, she said hurriedly, getting up from the bench and walking to the sandbox. Gerald remained seated, observing how skillfully she managed her little ones. From the outside, this scene seemed so ordinary and at the same time so endearing that tears welled up in his eyes. These could have been our children, Gerald thought to himself, and in frustration, he clenched his jaw so hard that the muscles in his cheeks started twitching. You have to keep an eye on these rascals, Vanessa said with a soft laugh, returning to the bench and brushing the sand off her jeans. Her eyes sparkled, her cheeks flushed, and she looked so beautiful and familiar, just like before, that it hurt Gerald's heart. Tell me, how have you been, he asked. You probably got married again? No, Vanessa laughed. I don't want to step on the same rake twice. I'm sorry, she smiled apologetically, but I don't hold a grudge against you. I'm happy now. I have my little boys. They are everything to me now. I don't need anyone else. And how about you? I assume you're dating someone? No, Gerald sighed heavily, and lowering his head, he absent-mindedly toyed with the sand at his feet with a little stick. I'm miserable, Vanessa, he said barely audibly and raised his head to look her in the eyes. The woman I was seeing turned out to be a fraud, there was nothing real about her. At the cafe, I didn't tell you that I was also expecting a child. I thought it was mine. But it turned out it wasn't, he let out another heavy sigh and continued, I've come to realize. I understand now, he whispered, looking at her intently. Forgive me, please, if you can. I forgave you a long time ago, Vanessa said gently, placing her hand on his shoulder. I've long since moved on and overcome everything. Now I have a completely different life, different concerns. It just wasn't meant to be for us, that's all. Do you really think that way? Gerald asked with hope. Yes, of course, Vanessa nodded. Don't be so hard on yourself forever. Make peace with yourself, and then you'll definitely find something or someone worth living for, she smiled at him with a tender, confident smile, and in this mature, beautiful woman, he saw his young, beloved fiancé, Vanessa. The tears welled up in his eyes again. He quickly stood up to hide his weakness and bid farewell. Take care. I'll be going, he said. We should be going too, she agreed, heading to get the children. Suddenly, Gerald came back and asked, can I come here sometime when you're out? 
It's a public park, Vanessa chuckled lightly. How could I object? Of course, you're welcome. Thank you. He lingered for a while, watching her shake the sand off the children, collect their toys, and lead the younger one to the stroller. The elder one walked briskly, full of excess energy, while the younger one struggled, awkwardly dragging one leg, and his head wobbled as if it were very heavy. Gerald squinted, trying to grasp some distant memory. The feeling that visited him when he saw this clearly sick child, but it faded like a quickly forgotten dream. He sighed again, put his hands in his pockets, and walked away resolutely in the opposite direction. Gerald had just returned from his wanderings a few days ago. During the years spent in foreign lands, he had come to understand that his short-lived life with Isabella was nothing more than an attempt to escape from a pressing problem. Bright, striking, and initially enigmatic, Isabella shattered his masculine ego. She drew him in like a careless insect attracted to a predatory tropical flower, drained all his vitality, and spat out an empty, unnecessary husk. At least, that's how he felt. To recover and realize what had happened to him, he spent those years far away from his homeland. Where had he been all these years? First in Alexandria, where he had been drawn since his youth. Ever since he first choked on reading Thais of Athens. There he spent a couple of months before traveling to Italy, then to Greece on Corfu. He then visited Misty Albion and traveled almost all over Europe. He gained a wealth of new experiences and was on the verge of settling permanently in some forgotten village on one of the Greek islands. He even found a house, but, at the last moment, a yearning for his homeland overwhelmed him, and he desperately wanted to see Vanessa again. Gerald couldn't resist his desire, so he cancelled all his plans and returned home on the next flight. Thankfully, at work, everything remained the same. This part of his life, which brought him consistently good income, kept him afloat and prevented him from sinking into despair when everything else collapsed. He settled in a hotel since he hadn't decided yet whether he would stay or leave again after some time. Just the other day, he randomly went to visit Vanessa, and his feet led him to their old apartment. He pressed the doorbell, and although he heard the familiar muffled sound, no one opened the door. After standing there for a few minutes, he almost turned around to leave but then the ever-present elderly neighbor appeared in the stairwell. Gerald? Is that you? It's me, Mrs. Robinson. God, I never thought I'd see you again. I'm half in the grave, always sick. Mrs. Robinson had been half in the grave as long as Gerald could remember. Can you tell me if Vanessa still lives here? She's here, the old woman nodded happily. Where else would she go? But I remember she went away for a while. Let me think, she mumbled, moving her lips as she counted something. It's been about two and a half years, I think. But she returned in the spring. She has two children now. You should go to the park, Gerald. They're always there at this time. So Gerald found them that day, thanks to the grandmother's tip, and ever since, he couldn't stop thinking about Vanessa every minute. He managed to wait for nearly a week out of propriety before heading to the park again. It was midsummer, and the heat was scorching, making his shirt stick to his back. There was no sign of Vanessa and the kids near the sandbox, which disappointed Gerald. He thought he wouldn't see them today. However, as he walked along the alley of old linden trees, he accidentally stumbled upon a fountain teeming with kids of all ages. That's where they were. Vanessa sat with sick Oswald on the edge, holding his hands to prevent him from falling. The boy stood knee-deep in the water, laughing joyfully, splashing his legs and spraying water all around. The second child wasn't easy to spot in the lively crowd. Just then, the automatically activated jet sprayed water upward, and the air filled with enthusiastic shouts. Hello. Gerald greeted Vanessa as he approached. How are you doing? Oh, hello, she responded, using one hand to support her son while brushing away the wet locks clinging to her forehead. Could you, Gerald, look after Oswald for me? Instead of putting him in the stroller, I'll find his brother quickly, as it's time to go home. Of course, Gerald said. Will he cry without you? No, Vanessa assured him. Besides, I won't take long. Look, Oswald, this is Uncle Gerald. He's nice. Play with him for now, okay? 
I'll find your brother and be right back. She left along the circular ledge, scanning among the jumping kids for her Ralph, and Gerald was left alone with Oswald. Hello, he said to the boy, taking his hand and winking, unsure of what else to do with such a small and limited movement child. Hello, the boy struggled to say, gazing attentively at the unfamiliar uncle. Hello, he repeated once more and suddenly smiled so openly and genuinely that Gerald involuntarily smiled back. You're so funny, he said to his temporary ward. Do you like swimming? No. Oswald is afraid, the boy said, amusingly stumbling over his words. Afraid, water. No need to be afraid of water, Gerald winked at him again. It's not scary. Look, the other kids are having fun swimming. They enjoy it. Yes, Oswald agreed. But Oswald is afraid. Let's go, I'll carry you, Gerald unexpectedly suggested, not knowing what made him say that. Would you like that? Yes, the boy said seriously. That's the spirit. The man easily lifted the almost weightless child and placed him on his shoulders. Hold on tight, he firmly held Oswald with his hands, controlling his own body. Let's go. He waded through the water, ignoring his wet trousers, straight to the center of the fountain. There, under the intermittent splashes and shimmering jewels in the bright sunlight, sudden strong streams covered them. Ah! Oswald shouted, and Gerald already scolded himself mentally, thinking the child was very scared. But instead, the boy kicked his legs and tapped on the man's chest, exclaiming unexpectedly, Hooray! Hooray! They went around the water structure twice before Gerald realized it was probably enough and turned back. Surprised and slightly bewildered by their absence, Vanessa laughed and waved at them from the edge. When she saw Gerald coming towards her, she said, Oh, my goodness, Gerald. You're all wet. Did Oswald not get scared at all? She skillfully picked up the happily laughing little boy and kissed his wet cheeks. Nonsense, in a couple of minutes, I'll be dry, Gerald told her, climbing out of the water. Look how the sun shines. Let's go to my place. At least, you can dry your clothes there, Vanessa suggested, and Gerald didn't hesitate for a second, immediately agreeing. Let's go. Pick me up, pick me up, Oswald whimpered, extending his weak arms to Gerald. No, no, Vanessa protested. Uncle is tired of playing with you. Let's go to the stroller. Uncle is not tired at all, Gerald said importantly. Come here, Oswald. Oswald happily took his place on the kind uncle's shoulders, and they all walked home together through the park. Gerald knew this path by heart and could walk it with his eyes closed. They had been strolling here with Vanessa all their lives. In spring, winter, and even during the stormy autumn weather. How he loved those leisurely walks. Here we are. Vanessa placed the older, tired-looking Ralph on the floor and opened the door with a key. Now, let's go to bed. Go to the bathroom for now, Gerald. There's a big robe there that should fit you, and hang your clothes on the balcony. I'll be there soon. And she went to the bedroom with the kids. Gerald entered the small bathroom. Now, it was littered with rubber toys and filled with shampoos in bright bottles. Children's clothes were drying on the towel rack. He took off his wet clothes, took a shower, and dried himself with a clean towel. The neatly stacked laundry was still in the cabinet, just like before. Vanessa had always folded them that way, and his hands automatically found the familiar items. The large bathrobe he was looking for indeed hung on a hanger. It was clearly a men's garment, and Gerald felt a pang of sadness, thinking that Vanessa wasn't living alone after all. But there was nothing to be done. He couldn't go out naked, after all. So he put on the robe, tied the belt, and went to hang his clothes on the balcony. At that moment, the hostess arrived. Rupert's robe suits you? I thought so. Gerald felt relieved. So it's Rupert's robe? Does he help you around the house? Yes, he comes with his wife sometimes. They help fix things or repair a tap. And they visit just for fun as well. They also have a baby girl recently, she smiled. We get along much better now. 
I'm glad for you, Gerald genuinely smiled. And how's your mother? She's still kicking, Vanessa laughed. She comes often to play with the grandkids. Come on, let's have some tea or coffee while your clothes dry, she invited him to the kitchen. The kitchen hadn't changed much either. The same furniture, the same coffee machine he had once given her for her birthday. Is it still working, he nodded towards it. Yes, why wouldn't it? Vanessa laughed. It's an old workhorse. They had cold tea with ice, lemon, and mint, as Vanessa always made during the summer heat. Thanks. Gerald put his glass down and looked at her. Would you mind telling me where the second one came from? Who are his parents? I don't know, Vanessa shrugged. Well, I know who his mother was, but she didn't tell me anything about the father. We were in the hospital together. In Israel, but it's a very long story. She gazed thoughtfully out the window, where the lunchtime sun still gilded the treetops in the distance. I'm not in a hurry anyway, Gerald smiled. But if I'm bothering you, I can leave. He was anxious, thinking that Vanessa must be tired of dealing with the kids and probably wanted to rest while they were asleep. No, you're not bothering much, Vanessa half-jokingly replied. I can't get rid of you while your clothes dry. Mama will take them tonight. The girls and I are going to celebrate Rose's birthday. Exactly. Her birthday is on the 10th, Gerald nodded. Give her my regards. Sure. She got up and poured them more tea. Actually, the story with Oswald's turned out quite interesting, she began, concentrating, furrowing her brow, and counting something on her knitting needles. Ralph had a medical condition from birth, without going into unnecessary details, I'll just say that we were advised to go abroad, where they know better how to treat such conditions. In the end, it was really helpful, and now he's completely healthy. She warmly smiled as she spoke about her son. In that clinic where we were in Bilinson, she began, I met this woman. She was so beautiful, but she was also so unhappy. You can't even imagine. It broke my heart to see her with her little son. He was just a couple of months younger than Ralph. I thought he was about a year younger, Gerald interjected, surprised. No, they were the same age. It's just that Oswald was born very weak. He had a whole bouquet of inherited diseases. A complex genetic deviation. Initially, our doctors gave him very little chance. But in Israel, he quickly started improving. He learned to walk, hold his head up, and even started talking after a while. Ralph and I were there for only three weeks, but they were already in their second year of treatment. She was completely exhausted. Not just because of her son's illness, but also due to the betrayal of her beloved man. It's such a sad story, Vanessa sighed, still gazing at her loops. When Isabella got pregnant, it was a miracle for her, just like it was for me. The only difference was that I spent several years and a lot of effort to have a child. After a previous unsuccessful abortion, she gave up on getting pregnant and didn't even try anymore. So it was quite a surprise and shock for her to find out that she was pregnant with her beloved man's child. He was married, but the moment he learned about Isabella's pregnancy, he immediately left his wife. They had prepared so much for the birth of their baby. They even rearranged the entire house for him. When she told me all this, her eyes sparkled with pleasant memories. But everything changed and fell apart in an instant when little Oswald was born a bit prematurely and with a bunch of health issues. The doctors immediately advised the parents to give him up. Isabella, of course, didn't want to hear anything like that. But her so-called husband. Here, Vanessa's face seemed to darken with anger. As soon as he found out that the child was born with disabilities, he immediately abandoned him. He paid the doctor for a fake DNA test to have an excuse to deny the child. Can you imagine? Isabella was in such shock. She cried all her tears, and that scoundrel accused her of infidelity. Anyway, when we met her, she was completely broken, on the verge of a nervous breakdown, almost transparent from the weight of her suffering. How could her soul endure it all? She later told me so much about her life. She had been unlucky from childhood. 
No one should have to go through such things, but throughout her life, she encountered wretches on her path. First, a stepfather raped her at the age of 14, then a boss coerced her into cohabitation and sent her for an abortion, and in the end, her beloved man betrayed her. Why do you say, in the end? Gerald asked softly, not knowing why this story of an unknown woman affected him so much. Because she died, Vanessa sadly replied, finally raising her eyes from her knitting. Right there, in that clinic. One day, she suddenly felt very unwell, passed out, and they examined her, finding stage for cancer. It was a very aggressive and fast-spreading type, unfortunately. She was fading away right before my eyes, crying all the time, and she asked me not to abandon Oswald. She said he wasn't needed by his biological father and wouldn't be needed by anyone in this world. She promised to always take care of him and protect him from everything. She had no relatives or she had cut off all ties with them long ago. That's how it was. Because of her and little Oswald, I had to stay there a bit longer, and I immediately found a lawyer to help with the necessary adoption papers. On the day she died, I already had approval for guardianship. Her last words were, thank you for taking care of him properly, my dear. Fate has found a new mom for my boy. If his father ever shows up, don't give him away. I beg you, don't give him away. She didn't say who his father was? Gerald asked hoarsely, coughing a bit to hide his emotions. Oh, you must have caught a cold at the pool, Gerald. And then you drank cold tea, caring Vanessa handed him a blanket from the tacta. Take it, cover yourself. It's cool here in the shade. It's fine, I just felt a little choked up, Gerald looked at her with worried eyes. Do you know any details? There's just a dash in his birth certificate, Vanessa shrugged. Well, I never really cared to know much about it. In the papers where her will was mentioned, there were some references to a man, probably. But she was never married to him. That's for sure. I was handling Oswald's inheritance, and I'm absolutely sure she was a single mother. Oh, I have her picture here. I put it in a frame so that Oswald never forgets his biological mom. She handed the photos to Gerald, and when he saw who was depicted in them, he almost dropped the frame from his hands. It was his Isabella, smiling as if she were alive, with an unfulfilled longing in her slightly slanted emerald eyes. In her arms, she held little Oswald, still so tiny. He must have been only a few months old then. Gerald bit his lip until it hurt, unable to speak. Bitter tears welled up in his eyes. Isabella, he finally exhaled, cautiously setting the portrait aside, putting his hand to his forehead, and closing his eyes tragically. What's wrong with you? Vanessa was genuinely worried, still not understanding. Do you know her? I do. Of course, I do, Gerald managed to say, and he looked at his former wife with such longing and desperation that she suddenly understood everything and couldn't believe it. She furrowed her brows in pain and shook her head in disbelief. No. No. It can't be. Alas, he wanted to approach her, but she made a warning gesture with her hand. Don't you dare. Vanessa. Listen. Gerald almost shouted, trying to tell his version of what happened. Listen to me. Get out, she turned away, not meeting his eyes, and cried out. Get out of my life, or I won't be responsible for what I do. He sighed, gathered his things from the rope, changed into something in the bathroom, and left the apartment, while Vanessa, with her cheeks burning from anger, burst into tears, hugging herself tightly and couldn't calm down for a long time, swaying from side to side until a plaintive call of Oswald came from the children's room. Mama. I'm coming, my boy. I'm coming, she responded immediately, wiping her tears and rushed out to be a caring and loving mother every minute of every hour of every day. All night long, Gerald smoked one cigarette after another as if he had never quit, and wrote a letter to Vanessa. He wanted to explain, justify himself, and share what he thought and felt when he saw that cursed pregnancy test. He wanted to tell her that Isabella was never open and sincere with him, at least not for long. Perhaps only for a few short months, when she believed that she could finally be happy, but even then, it was difficult for her. She never told him about her past. She was always composed and strict, 
buttoned up all the way, an impenetrable lady. Gerald wrote, crossed out, tore, and threw away many sheets filled with his emotions. He wrote again, finally pouring out everything that weighed on his soul. He opened his laptop and typed what he had written, sending it to Vanessa's email. He thought it would be faster and easier for her to read it that way. At the end of his letter, he begged her to forgive him. He said he had always loved and would love only her, that he didn't want anything else in this life but to be with them, with her and the boys. A day passed, then another. Gerald couldn't eat, drink, or sleep, and he checked his email every minute. Was there any reply? But there was no letter, no call, not even a simple message. He felt a deep longing again. He wanted to drink himself into oblivion, but he remembered in time that it wouldn't help him. He wrote to Vanessa again, pleading with her to at least tell him where Isabella was buried. But she didn't answer him either, and then he realized that she probably hadn't read his letters at all. Clenching his teeth, he packed a few things into a suitcase and firmly decided to leave for his Greek islands and never come back. But at the very last moment, when the car he had ordered to the airport was about to arrive, someone rang the doorbell. He opened it without any premonitions. Vanessa stood on the threshold. May I come in? Yes. Yes, he rushed to accommodate her, flustered, ushering her into the room. Please, come in. I read your letter, she said, walking to the window and turning away from him. I, too, felt bitter and sorry for myself. Believe me, but after thinking it over properly, I came to the conclusion that everything that happened to us was predestined, and we can't escape our fate. And also, she slightly turned and looked at him, now that I know everything about you, am I entitled to deprive Oswald of his biological father? Therefore, she said, it's up to you, Gerald. Stay in our lives or leave. What will you choose? Of course, I'll stay, he said fervently, dropping to his knees beside her and hugging Vanessa. Clinging to her like a little boy, he sobbed uncontrollably. Vanessa. My love. Forgive me, please, forgive me. I will never. Come on, she said, gently turning his head up by the chin. Let's go home. The children are waiting for us. And they went. Along the way, they dismissed the taxi driver who had been trying unsuccessfully to reach his inattentive client. Gerald handed him a bill. Sorry, my friend. Not today. The happy taxi driver smiled, looking at them, and said, get in. Why walk when you can ride? I'll take you there in no time. Not today. Gerald repeated, smiling. Today we'll walk. And they really walked, following the old, familiar route from their student days, across the bridge, past the town hall, and further, further into their dearest and most beloved corner in the world, where they had been so happy once. And now, with renewed hope that had returned to them, they believed that happiness still lay ahead.